But I want you to be praying about all that. Again, thank you for joining us online. Thank you for being here tonight. We're glad you're here. Uh, and then um, don't forget to drop your offering off in the offering box uh, because we had a couple of tough Sundays and we're asking God to help us get caught back in some of it. Let's stand together, please, reading God's Word, a familiar passage of Scripture. We're in a series right now, if you're a guest tonight, in a series entitled Our Journey Home. Now, I am emphasizing the journey. I will eventually get to the part about the streets of gold and the gates of pearl and how we're going to know each other up there and all that. I'll eventually get to all that stuff that you probably all already know about, about, but you want to see some Bible on that, and we'll get to that. But I'm concentrating on our journey, the trip there, just like uh, the Robertsons were singing about uh, our walk with the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes you think you're just kind of going around in the same, same direction all the time, but we are on our way home. How many of y'all believe we're on our way home? And we are bound for the promised land. And so tonight, I want to talk about actually the road that we're on that leads to a gate. Look at verse number 13. Jesus is speaking here, and he says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way. So you got a gate in glory, but then you've got a way. You've got a path there, a road there, a highway there. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in their at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way. There's the idea again, the way or the path to glory, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, I want you to hold your place here. I want you to turn back to Joshua in the Old Testament. I just want to kind of give you a thought here from the Old Testament in Joshua chapter uh, number, um, Joshua chapter number three. Joshua chapter number three, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And... Um, I want to just read a phrase here. Now, I'm going to give you a real quick picture. They're going to cross over Jordan. Joshua's going to lead them over Jordan into the promised land. Some say it's a picture of heaven. Really, it's a, it's a truer picture of crossing over into the Christian life and the battle of the Christian life, to be honest with you. You can take it both ways because we sing about crossing over Jordan and we're bound for the promised land and all that. Hymns aren't always doctrinally quite, quite right, but let's just kind of roll with it. But I want to show you what Joshua says here in verse number four, and then I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this in my introduction. Verse four. Yeah, there, yeah now there, keep, keep in mind, all, just under two million Jews. How many understand that's a lot of people? And so he's trying to tell them how they're going to move, how they're going to cross over this, this Jordan. Yet there should be a space between you and it and 2,000 cubits, that's about 3,000 feet by measure, Come not near unto it, speaking of the ark of God. I want you to have 3,000 feet between the front of the crowd and the ark, that ye may know the way, there's that word again, by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. That phrase right here. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. How many understand you get one shot at going to heaven? We've not passed this way before. We have no idea what's going to be laid down in front of us as I preached last week. Tonight, I want to preach on this subject, staying on the right road, staying on the right road. Father, bless your word, please, and challenge us with truth tonight. Help us, Lord, to make this come alive now. We've all come to church tonight, and those of us that are born again, we're on the highway. We're headed for heaven. And help us, Lord, to make sure we're on the right road, going the right way, and not taking any detours, we pray, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Enter in at the straight gate, he said. As we make our way to heaven, we must admit that we're traveling a narrow road in a wide culture. Let me say that again. We are traveling a narrow road in a wide culture. And what I mean by that is this. Jesus is the one that said the way to heaven is narrow. And uh, he's the one that explains it right here. But here we are, and, and, and the broad is the way was easy of destruction. So we got this, we got this almost like, uh, it's almost like there's, there's uh, no, uh, there's no guardrails. I'm studying the book right now. I was talking about one of the things, one of the subjects in the book is on postmodernism. And the idea behind there is we've already moved through the modern thinking of our society, which really that height was back in the 70s with the open, uh, promiscuous uh, lifestyle of the hippies. But now we're past that. It's worse now than ever. 
Some of the stuff that's being propagated right now in the political realm and the philosophies that are driving one side of this thing is wide open society, socialism, which is Marxism, postmodernism, and some of those things. And same way within religions. Religion now says, well, there are many roads to heaven. There's many ways to get to heaven. You know, there's not just the Christian way. By the way, right now in independent Baptist churches, that's being shoved up both nose holes of you all that are millennials. Because I'm hearing right now that I, I just want to go hear grace. I just don't want to be judged. I don't want anybody to tell me what I'm doing wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, this book right here has a lot of stuff that we can do that's right, but it has a lot of stuff that we're doing that's wrong. And understand, it's just life. And it's good for us. If you were headed for a, if you were headed for a chasm where the bridge was out, you would want somebody to tell you, scream at you, whatever, to get you to stop. And so uh, we're, we're getting fed a whole lot of stuff out there on blogs that have nothing to do with the Word of God. Why don't you go ahead and check and see if some of the philosophies that you're being fed on your blogs, some of the books that you're reading, why don't you go ahead and check and see if there's any Bible, real Bible in it. Okay, well, that's just introduction. So, so as we make our way to heaven in this, on this narrow road in a wide culture, we, we have to keep our eyes on something or someone really to make sure that we don't mess up. That's why I took you back to Joshua. In Joshua, chapter number three, what was going on is you've got these just under, uh, some estimated about 1.8 million people. I can't even, I saw the picture the other day of the prayer crowd in Washington, D.C. there around the monument and all of that. How many say that was a lot of people? Now, you don't hear anything about stuff like that when Christians get together to pray. That's a lot of people. But still, I don't know what the number was. Probably in the mid, uh, you know, 50,000, something like that, I'm not sure. But anyway... 1.8 million people standing around in the desert getting ready to cross a, a, a river. And God opens up the river just like he did the Red Sea and all that. But he said this. He said, now, we've never done this before. You've not been this way before. So i got to get you to do something. We're going to put the ark out here about 3,000 feet. I don't know how far that is. I'm going to guess from here probably to the, to the Little League baseball field, maybe, something like that. About 3,000 feet, maybe further than that, maybe to the Almarnot Road back there, which I had never figured out why we named that Almarnot. But anyway, so why did they do that? Why was that verse even in the Bible? I'm going to tell you why. Because when you're right up on a particular focal point, you cannot, everybody can't see it. That's why people be standing in the back going, where's it at? Where's it at? We don't know which way to go. And you got these, all these people spread out. So the way to get across this narrow passage of the Jordan River that God opens up, dries up the land, you can read the rest of it there in chapter number three. The way to get across there, the ark was going to go first and everybody's going to follow, but they had to stay back far enough to where everybody could see. Now the idea was this, keep your eyes on the ark. The ark was the abode of God. So the way we're going to get across the Jordan River is we're going to keep our eyes on God. How many understand what I'm talking about? Does anybody understand the logistics of all this? Okay. So, and he said, we're going to do this because we've never been this way. We're crossing a river. The people, if they'd been right up on the ark, they would have thought, well, well, well uh, there's a river out there. I mean, we've got water here. we got water here. They couldn't see the hole in the middle. So the idea <coughs> is keep your eyes on God. Now, I will tell you this, that the only way that you and I are going to get through our journey to that straight gate on this narrow road don't miss this. You got to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this again. I don't know about you, but I understand that only get, I, I'm only going to make this journey one time. I get one shot at it, and I want to make sure that I'm on the right road, going the right way. I don't take any detours off of that road. Now, let me just uh, stop and say this. You, you may back up and say, why in the world would the preacher be preach four messages on Sunday morning about a biblical, a biblical Christian. Let me tell you why, for this very reason. I want to make sure people's on the right road. I want to, everything's so whacked out into such weird philosophies and agendas and belief systems out there. As a pastor, I want to make sure that people understand clearly from the Bible what a Christian is. We talked about that foundationally. What is a Christian? What, we, I, I hope you were here for that. The second message was, was, what is a dedicated Christian? I hope you heard all that. Third message, what is, what is a baby Christian? I said this, I said, because the Bible deals with a baby Christian, then you and I need to know what it is, and we need to know if we're a baby Christian or not. And by the way, it goes without saying there's a lot of baby Christians. 
And then the one <coughs> that you didn't like this past week was, what is a backslidden Christian? Because the Bible talks about people forsaking the Lord, then we've got to deal with what a backslidden Christian is. I know it wasn't a popular message. You say, how do you know? Because everybody just sat there looking at me. But I do that for a reason. Because I'm the pastor of this church. I'm not a hireling. And I'm going to tell you, thus saith the word of God, because I have to stand before God someday and give an account for my ministry and how I led people. And so tonight we're going to take a look at this as we make our journey home, make sure we're on the right road, go in the right direction. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. And I've got three points here, so we'll shut her down a little bit. Years ago, after my wife and I first got married, we, we were in South Carolina. I don't remember exactly where we were, but I remember that Interstate 40 stopped at Wilmington for just for trivia matters. It goes from Wilmington to Barstow, California. And uh, I've always wanted to make that whole trip. I've always wanted this weird. I've always wanted, this, I'd always wanted to be in at I-40 um, one hour before sundown and drive as far as I could get and drive through the time zones and just see how far I could get before the sun, or, or before the sun caught up. it got dark anyway. That's silly, I guess. But we got on that interstate. This was uh, somewhere between Raleigh and Wilmington. We were headed home, heading east. We lived in West Virginia at that time. We had no GPS in those days. All we had was a road map. So we got on, uh, we got on the interstate, and we had traveled nearly an hour, and all of a sudden my wife sees a road sign that says 20 miles to Wilmington. <laughs> Do you remember that, honey? I, and I thought, oh, my. Now, thank the Lord, we weren't, we weren't in any big hurry, but I went an hour out of my way, so I had to go back. That was two hours added to a very long trip anyway. And so uh, here's the idea. We were on the right road, but going the wrong way. And can I just say, as we preach this past Sunday about backsliding, many Christians find themselves on the right road, but going the wrong way. Tonight, we're going to take another step further. There are those that just are flat out on the wrong road. I want you to notice, please, number one, taken from, uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 7, number one, there are two roads. Would you write that down? There are two roads. Um, by the way, getting on the right road is half the battle. Jesus said, here are the roads. Jesus said, one road leads to life and one road leads to destruction. That, of course, is speaking about hell. One road leads to life, one road leads to destruction or hell. Jesus said... Uh, also regarding this traveling, this walk, this path, he said in uh, Matthew 10, 9, uh, that he's the door. He said, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So this road or this path or this door or this gate that we go through has the idea of a peaceful pasture. And so as we have peace with God in the world, he said, we'll have tribulation. But he said, in me, you'll have peace. Then uh, I'm speaking of our salvation and having it all settled. Jesus also said this in John 14, 6. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the idea here is the path coming to the Father. How are we going to come to the Father? How are we going to get through that straight gate? All right, you got to go through Jesus who said, I'm the way. There's that word again, the truth and the life. So on our journey to heaven, Jesus will be the center of attraction. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father by me. So we get saved by Jesus Christ, and then we follow Jesus Christ. And so what I'm saying is, making sure you're on the right road, Jesus is the center of attraction. He is the, uh, he's the truth. In other words, he's the centerpiece. Uh, that way is narrow. How, how many understand just how narrow truth is? It has no tolerance. Two plus two equals what? How many believe that's the truth? Unless you do new math. What goes up must come unless you've got some other thing to break gravity. Man always has a way of skirting around the truth. But I want everybody to know this. Truth is, is Jesus Christ is the epitome of truth. He said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. And it said that, that in that he was the truth, he became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, speaking of Jesus, we have the Bible in our lap. All we know about Jesus Christ we find in this book right here. 
And for us to walk away from the Bible, we walk away from truth and we're going to have an awful miserable life as a Christian. Because in our walk, in this travel, in this journey home, our focal point, just like that ark out there was a picture of God, our focal point is on the Son of God. Uh, uh, my wife and I, in our life, whenever things kind of get rough and, and we're going through maybe a difficult stage in the ministry with people or maybe something's not going the right direction, well, understand, we've got to double down on that. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Right now, all of you know, your ship is rocked right now in a big, big way. And I understand that. You say, how am I going to get? keep your eyes on Jesus? We say this all the time. How does people make it without the Lord Jesus Christ? I was talking to one of our folks that was in the hospital this past week. Talked to him on the phone. Finally, they were finally able to talk. I was talking to him on the phone. And they said to me, how do you make it through without Jesus Christ? And so uh, we understand that Jesus says, I'm the door. We understand that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that what? Hath not what? Hath not the Son hath not what? You either got him or you don't have him. That's the truth. And so uh, from time to time, we'll take a look at where Jesus is out there. We'll check our road map, the Bible, from time to time to make sure that we're on the right road. Jesus also said this. He said, talking about the two roads, he also said that he is the light. He lights our path. John chapter 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again in him, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So, what about the other path? Just to be clear, God makes his way to heaven very noticeable. What about the broad way? The broad way has darkness in it. The broad way has a lot of tolerance. No guardrails. The broad way doesn't have the light. We sing a song, Stepping in the Light. That's talking about our journey home, our walk with God. I'm so glad they sang that song, man. I'm just rolling off of that. That's so neat. And so we understand that the, the, the broad way and the, and the wide gate, it's a piece of cake. But it leads to destruction. It leads to hell. Number two, there are two results. There are two results. Here are the results, destruction or eternal life in heaven. Only two. Sadly, Jesus says here in verse number 14, and few there be that find it. For those of you who think that there's just a majority of people as Christians in the world, you need to rethink that. It's not true. In fact, if mission statistics are true, half the world has never heard the gospel clearly for the first time. Don't pattern the rest of the world's thought, worldview, based upon the worldview here in America, which, by the way, is failing drastically. Even Christians now, statistics say, even Christians don't even have a good biblical worldview. That's why more and more Christians are embracing abortion on demand and gay marriage, etc., because they've lost their direction, their worldview. They're not looking out there. They're not keeping their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Word. And so uh, you have to rebel against this path to miss it. But people do it all the time. Number two, there are two results, destruction or eternal life. To be sure, there is a letter, literal hell taught throughout Scripture. And those who reject the gospel of Christ will spend eternity in hell where the worm dieth not. Jesus said, and the fire is not quenched. That means that we go to hell in a conscious body of some type even though our body goes back to the grave there's a consciousness there why don't you take your bibles please and turn to luke 16 would you do that luke chapter 16 this is a very dark section of scripture that we don't hear enough about but as you develop your philosophy in this new world that we live in you need to remember this is true. Jesus said it, and this will never go away. In fact, Jesus spoke more on hell than he spoke about heaven. Look at verse number 19 of Luke chapter 16. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. And by the way, for those of you who are reading the liberal commentaries that said this is a parable, Jesus never mentioned names in parables. 
And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He's in bad shape. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember, circle that word. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can, can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come in this place, circle that word, of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them, which he, what he's saying in essence is, they have the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He said, I'm not going to do any miracles, I'm not going to do any more for, for you than I've done for anybody else or your brothers. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. You, you, people say, Well, I've, I've, I saw fire come out of heaven, or if I saw this or this or this, whatever happened, I'd believe. Well, you're not going to get that chance. Because God has given us the word of God. It is truth, and that's what we have to believe in Jesus Christ. And so here we have several things. First of all, notice there are two eternal places mentioned. Abraham's bosom, which is a picture of heaven, and then hell. Two places. There's, there's no in-between. There's no purgatory. There's no nirvana. There's no uh, release from karma, as the Buddhists teach. And I could go on and on and on about some of the crazy philosophies that people believe that folks are going to experience after they close their eyes on, in death on this side. In fact, the Bible says in verse number 26 that there's a great golf fix that you can't pass from one side to the other. So if you've ever been told that you could pray somebody, uh, that when somebody dies, uh, you can pray them out of purgatory or light candles or whatever, you, can, you can't. There's a great golf fix. You can't pass. Once you're there, you're there forever. And so the idea here is, there are two eternal places mentioned here. Notice in verse 25 that the rich man had a conscious choice. Look at verse number 25. But Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. He said, you had your shot. You get one shot at this road. Are you on the right road? You get on that road by believing the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and praying by faith and receive him as your savior. And so the rich man had a conscious choice. And then notice in verse 28 that hell is a literal place of torment. He says, lest they also come into this place of torment. It's not a, uh, it's not a out of body experience. It is some type of spiritual body which is eternal that's there forever. And of course, in the last day, the dead are raised and then those bodies are cast in the lake of fire or just the same way that our bodies are reunited with our souls and all of that. And so what a special day it's going to be, the rapture that is. And so there are two results. Number three, there is a re resolution in Matthew chapter 7 that takes place. There's a resolution that takes place. Jesus is speaking uh, of our journey here, and he, and he says that few be that go in thereat, and many, many be which go in the broad gate, and few find the narrow way and the straight gate. As he was speaking of our journey home again to heaven in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, 
He says this, he says, strive, same, same idea, strive to enter into the straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. I accent that word strive. Strive. There's a resolution. You can almost say that when you're born again, there's a revolution. Because you love Christ, you're turning your back on the world, you're moving forward, you're trying to do what's right. But I think there's often a resolution or a decision to become a Christian does not come without a determined decision in your heart. And the same is true with your journey to heaven. There will be a certain striving to stay on the right road, go in the right direction. Notice the words in our text back in chapter 7, the straight gate and the narrow way. The word straight means narrow, but the thought is not speaking about the size of the gate, but the stringency, you might say, of the path leading to the gate. I mean, this is the best illustration I can give you. I was in the new courthouse the other day back in June and a uh, big long line everybody was social distancing there and <clears throat> when you come in you some of you have been there you come in you've got this turnstile type thing and then you've got this metal detector it's, it's narrow well the line starts to choke down and then you go one by one in that door and you go through the turnstile and uh, then you're asked to unload your pockets and make sure that you you uh, don't have any metal on you or whatever, and you have to go through all of that. It's required. Now, I'm not trying to say that the narrow road and the straight gate is talking about work salvation. I am telling you that the Christian life is tough. So our road to heaven, as I taught last week about adversity on our road to heaven, our road to heaven is going to be a very, very difficult thing. And they're going, you're going to be tempted to turn around and go the other way. I hope you don't do that. We're not teaching work salvation, but we are saying the Bible lets us know that God expects a lifestyle change for those who follow him. And the teachings of Christ bear that out. Take up thy cross and follow me. Everybody wants the path of least resistance of being a Christian. And by the way, can I say this as kindly as I can? Up until this point in America, we have pretty well had that. Church has not been that difficult, and overnight it has become difficult. Living for Christ, you've not suffered a whole lot of persecution, but that's changing. When they shoot Christians in the street in America, and they jail Christians singing hymns outside a courthouse, but rioters go free. Now, I'm going to tell you something. America is headed for a payday. And I want you to be schooled from the scriptures and be ready. I want it all to go away. And God knows how much your pastor and your pastor's wife stand on our knees praying for this ministry. And asking God to turn things around for us. But he's in control of all that. And God's going to see us through. I'm just talking about our journey home. You didn't think it was going to be like this. I know. You thought it was all going to be about fluff and clouds and halos and everything. We might get to that, although I probably won't talk about fluff and clouds and halos because you're not going to get a halo. <laughs> oh, you didn't know that? You're going to get a crown, and if you have a lick of sense, you're going to cast your crowns back at the Lord's feet if you get a crown. And so... Uh, Again, we notice the words wide gate and broad way. Broad means spacious with no restraints. And the fact that many there be that go in there at. Now, here's the resolution. There's a resolution that takes place. There seems to be a constant resolution that takes place in the heart of every believer when they trust Christ. That's why we sing the song, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler. Nobler, thank you. These have alert. These have alert my sights. This resolution's constant. 
because you got the clanging bells of the of the world all the time. You got all your friends. And I wrote this down because I want to get this. All of a sudden, you look back. And many of your friends are going completely a different direction and immediately you begin to question your decision. So you got, you got this way right here, this straight and narrow going in that straight gate. This is the way you're heading. And you look over here and all your buddies are going this way. And there's a lot, a whole lot more on that trail than is on your trail. That feeling never really leaves you as you journey to heaven. A lot of people fall off the wagon because of it. But the wise believer would be continually looking at God's road and God's map, resolving that you're on the right road. And in your heart, you become more committed to stay on that road. How did that 1.8 million Jews get across that tiny divide in that river? I'm going to tell you how they did it. They kept their eyes on that ark. And I'm assuming the lay of the land and where they fouled in that little narrow I don't think they social distance by the way but they fouled in that river somebody could always see that ark there it is there it is and right now you and I need to be looking at Jesus the author and finisher of our faith so here the Bible teaches there are only two directions two destinations and only two choices that can be made only two no more and tonight, if there's more than one way to heaven, understand Jesus lied, the apostles lied, Jesus would have died in vain, the apostles would have suffered martyr deaths in vain, it would have been necessary, and churches down through the ages have been lying all along to the masses. Which, by the way, is exactly what Marxism teaches, and socialism, and postmodernism. And that's why we're getting the pushback. I've been preaching, I quit saying because I can't do math quick in the pulpit, but for a long time, over 30 some years, I think 33, 34, 34, 35, 40, 45, something like that. I have never felt any pushback until now. And for some reason, people are supposed to be on the right road are changing their minds left and right. Which I think I said this Sunday morning. As you run reference on backsliding in the Old Testament, New Testament, it always runs and coincides with apostasy. Are you on the right road? Are you going the right direction? Was there a day in your life when you bowed your head and you prayed and trusted Christ as your Savior? And right now, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried three days, and he rose again the third day. And you believe that with all of your heart. If you believe that, say amen. amen. You're on the right road. If you're not careful, you're going to watch society right now. And you're going to see a lot of people that some you even went to church with going the wrong way. And you're going to have to make a resolution. I'm going to stick with the Lord. I'm going to stick with what I know. Now, if there's anything I know, is this. You know I'm telling you the truth. Because you're watching it happen. And I want to tell you because I love you that I'm thankful that I'm on the right road. And I thank, you for all, thank God for all those songs in that songbook. I, I wanted to pick one out and sing it to you right now. But there's just all kinds of songs in there about traveling on the right road. I'm bound for the promised land. The list goes on and on and on. I'm thankful that God gave us a wonderful road. And that road, if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, will be like a peaceful pasture. We get our eyes off Jesus. We don't know where we're going. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And teach us, Lord, as we journey home. There'll be pitfalls. There'll be opportunities for detour. There'll be people that we're walking with that turns and goes the other way. Don't have to be judged and chastened according to Romans, Hebrews chapter 12. Don't let us go that way. Help us go the right way. Lord, it's going to be people that we love, maybe family members, people that we love, 
Friends of a lifetime that they change in their mind philosophically, they turn and go another direction. Help us to be the strong one that goes in the right direction. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. The right road. The right road. Are you on the right road? They're going to play softly here in just a moment. We're going to sing. But I want to ask you right now, if you're to die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? If not, you're in the best place you can be to come to the Lord. We'll have somebody standing on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'd love to take that Bible tonight and show you how you could be a born-again Christian. Would you come? Would you come? Don't guess about it. Don't struggle with it. Just get it fixed. Tonight, maybe you have a loved one that is going the wrong way. Or maybe they're on the wrong road. You want to pray for them. Let's take a moment to do that tonight. If you've been saved, not been baptized, we'd love to help you with that. If you've been saved and baptized, like to join our church, we want you to come. These men will help you with all of that. Father, bless us invitation time as we sing together, please. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. You come. Would you do that? I have